Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're gonna be talking about how I got interested in F Sharp. So I get asked a lot about what got me into F Sharp and why I use it over other languages. I have specific reasons, but a lot of those reasons are really rooted in my journey and experience with other languages and technologies over the years. So in this post, I'm gonna share a brief look into my technology journey and what I learned before eventually landing on F Sharp as a core part of my tech stack. Now, if you're interested in getting started with F Sharp yourself, as opposed to like my, I, my journey to getting to F Sharp, um, you can check out the best way to get started learning and building with F Sharp uh, for a better guide on that. C Sharp and the status quo. In college, we mostly had classes in Java and Python. I learned JavaScript on the side to build full stack projects that I could share with others via the web. And my first job out of college was at a C Sharp shop, which was a hard but good switch compared to the you know technologies I was using before. C Sharp has a lot of things going for it. In my opinion, it's a better version of Java. It's got good types, you know, for a mainstream OO language a large ecosystem, and a very solid runtime, making it a pretty good choice for many different kinds of applications. When I think of like a good general purpose programming language, um, .NET definitely fits that bill with C Sharp. So for all intents and purposes, this is a good language, both in isolation, you know, when we look at its parts, does this, is this a cohesive whole? Does it work well? Is it good to use? But also relative to the rest of the field, can it stack up to all the other languages and what it's trying to do and how it does it? It does many things well and often better than most. And yet it has many of the shortcomings that most languages have had over the last several decades. And I think this area is gonna like, you know, piss off a lot of purists, um, but this is not even a complete list. And, you know, probably going into each one of these uh, would be its own video or several videos. So we're just gonna briefly go over this. Um, yes, there's gonna be some, you know, hand waviness because we can't really dive into this stuff, but uh, all of this is, is, you know, true in my experience. All right, so the first big one, um, that's an issue in, in most languages is that everything can be null. So the billion dollar problem that leads to things breaking when we think they're safe and implicit null checks everywhere to try and inevitably fail to prevent this because we're scared the types are lying to us. They are. And the reason this is so bad is because most languages, you can say that this is gonna be a dog, but it can always be a null. And so this leads to breakages everywhere all the time. Um, and in order to prevent these breakages, you have to be extra careful, which leads to basically every time you're looking at what a thing is, you, you need extra code to handle this. Um, so your code gets much larger with this boilerplate you have to do everywhere and still you can fail um, because there's nothing helping you remember how to do this right um, or basically doing it for you. We have types, but they're lying to us. So the types are weaker than we'd like. And now I will mention that um, C Sharp has uh, strict null checking and has had, I think since C Sharp, I don't know, 12 or 11 or 10 or something like that. So it's had it for a few years, but that doesn't mean people are using it. <laughs> um, I had just interviewed with, with people actually uh, last year, a big well-known company, I won't throw them under the bus, and they were using like C-sharp six or C-sharp seven, uh, which doesn't have this, which is crazy to me, like, you know, update your C-sharp, but you know, C-sharp's not alone. A lot of languages have this awful, uh, but it's also ubiquitous, it's, it's in most languages. Okay, the next one is exception-based control flow. Um, super common in OO languages. I don't know of an OO language that like didn't do this by default if it was built, um, you know, before the 2020s. Um, and this is just bad because it's the deer in the headlights approach to this. It's like, ah, I'm doing a bad thing. I'm in the road. Let me just stand here and get hit which obviously leads to you panicking and dying by default, which is, you know, not a good way for a system to run. It's just not, there's better, ba there's better ways. Um, but this is mainstream, this is in most languages. Okay, next one is no native discriminated unions. Um, all a discriminated union is saying that this is either, is this or it's that but it's nothing else, okay? It's this or it's that, it's A or it's B. This seems trivial, this seems dumb, stupid, not necessary, but this leads to so many overly complex, bad system designs in regular software that at this point, it should be baked into every new programming language. It's a, if it's not, you are creating a huge pit of failure. So this almost always leads to unnecessary complexity to try and make this work in a language that doesn't support this, which is most languages that were built before like the twenties. And this is always something we try to do because this happens in real life all the time. Okay, we can accept cache 
or credit, nothing else. It's one of these two things, but we must handle them differently. I will write with a pen or a pencil. There are other things out there, but these are the two I'm using and they have slight differences. My cart is either empty or not empty. And based on that, I can either leave the store without getting arrested or I must go to the cashier before I can leave. So this happens in real life all the time. And the idea of software is to model real life as closely as possible so that we can do whatever our automations are. Um, and this is a huge source of what I call unnecessary complexity, which is things that we do in software that are more complex than the actual domain we're modeling. They're actually more complex than reality um, because we can't model them that well. Okay, if you're on the software side of this and you do not believe me, think of the last time you tried to use an enum. Why did you use that enum? In most cases, what you're trying to do is build a discriminated union and a language that doesn't support this. And therefore, the closest thing you have as a way to model this is use an enum, put it into a type, and now you're going to check that type to see what the enum is to understand what that type is. This is a discriminated union with extra steps and worse safety because you're just relying on this du or this enum that you've created to be correct for the rest of the thing. Okay, so we do interesting things to approximate this missing functionality in these languages that don't support it because we always need this because this is what actually happens in reality. And so we, we do weird things to try to do this that, that adds so much unnecessary complexity. Okay, one common way to do this is um, interface implementers lie. So we create interfaces so that functions can code to the interface and not care about the underlying implementation. This allows you to shoehorn multiple things through the same type. But often that interface is not a snug fit for the underlying types. So some types may need to have placeholder returns, passes, or not implemented exceptions to fill the interface, thus lying about what they do. And this almost always happens if you have more than uh, two implementations of an interface, um, you'll almost always find that this is true because the interface is actually not precise enough to say what these implementations are. There's just little bits where they're off by a little bit and therefore the interface is wrong and it's lying to us. Interface users must reach into internals to know what they're working on. So this is that enum idea that I was telling you earlier, where it's like, why do you have an enum? And it's because you're trying to do something based on the enum. But if you're trying to do something based on the enum, that means that your interface is not good enough to control the behavior, right? You are trying to say, what is this? I need to change something. And therefore coding to the interface is actually not correct. That's actually not what you're trying to achieve because it's not good enough. And so, yeah, while in theory an interface means you don't need to know what the implementation is doing and practice you often do need to know what it's doing to actually use them reasonably. Like, is this a bicycle or a motorbike? I need to know this because I, I'm going to have some ways that I'm going to use them differently depending on what it is. Um, is this a duck or a dog? Depending on it, I have to treat it differently. You know, and a common one is like, when we get a request, is it authenticated? Is it unauthenticated? Is this like a super user that get, gets access to everything? We have these all the time throughout reality, through software, and so we're doing this all the time. And so every time we have to bend over backwards to model this extra unnecessary complexity. Okay, the final way that I, I see this often is strategy patterns instead of interface. And what this really means is that there's a lot of implicit logic under the hood. We have no idea what it's choosing. And so lots and lots of ways for this to just implicitly break uh, in internally. And so that's my end rant on, you know, do use, go look them up, great things. Um, every language should have it in the 20s. That's, that's, that's the point of this. Okay, so yes, there are ways around these. And there's certainly ways to do these right. And so that you're not you know, having all these problems. But if a thing regularly breaks in the same ways, you gotta wonder if it's the user's fault or maybe the thing just isn't designed very well. And this is that book, what the, the design of everyday things or whatever, it's its whole thesis. Now, regardless, this is not a bash on C-sharp. In my opinion, C-sharp is one of the better options out there, but it is to show that the status quo, while popular, is not without its downsides. I could easily list more issues and other languages with similar issues in the mainstream. So Java is probably the most similar that runs into all these issues. Um, Golang has its implicit nils and garbage uh, return values, which are just implicitly based on the value of a nil, which is crazy, um, and doesn't really have good type narrowing um, with generic support or DUs, things like that. Um, C and C++ has its own issues with unsafe memory types, etc. And then Rust is actually quite good, but of course, to get the same kind of power, there's often a lot of boilerplate involved um, with the addition of like borrows and stuff like that, which can be very well, but 
come on, it's just extra work. And so they've all got issues. And these are just like, this is what, you know, the state of programming languages is <laughs> this year. Um, but there's there's issues with the status quo. Now I do want to say that like C sharp isn't all bad. Like it, it is one of the better options. And there's one thing I really did like about C sharp that I hadn't seen before and miss in a lot of other languages that don't have something similar. And that is link with method syntax. It's essentially type safe chain operations on lists, which is giving like selects, where, singles, first, order by, etc. Kind of like JavaScript's map and filter, but with a lot of niceties built in. So a lot of kind of first order, higher order, um, nice operations you can do on lists, which is the majority of programming if you know we're being honest with ourselves. Now, I found this paradigm of programming to be super easy to work with in terms of ease of coding and correctness. This got me trying to write more of my code in a link-like fashion and wondering if there are ways to do this more easily for more kinds of programming, aka like not lists. Can we do this on single items? Can we do this on types? Things like that. So I liked C Sharp in its ecosystem. I liked how it was good at so many things and I really loved it when I could code with Link. But every program still felt like a bit of a burden with lots of boilerplate and mental overhead to get it to do what I wanted without falling into the numerous implicit pits of failure. TypeScript and good types. So C Sharp was the main language I used and learned in the early years of my career for work and side projects. But I was also dabbling in TypeScript for front ends and full stack apps. Front end web was, and largely still is, dominated by heavyweight client frameworks like React, so JavaScript and TypeScript was the native tongue. There's a lot of things I don't like about JavaScript, but I wouldn't bet against it. It's the language of the web, and the web only gets more ubiquitous. TypeScript solved a lot of the common issues I ran into when working on JavaScript code bases, mostly by adding types. And in my opinion, static types with dev time type checking. So not just at builds, not just with linters, but like really built into, you know, your IntelliSense and giving you red squigglies and exactly what's wrong, um, you know, seconds after you write it, is the single most impactful thing for improving dev speed at scale. And TypeScript added that. Now TypeScript does not solve all the problems of JavaScript. It is still JS under the hood after all. And TypeScript even adds complexity due to its need for extra build steps, which to be honest, were much more complex and less stable to set up than they are today. This means that sometimes the types are a lie because JavaScript said something was A, but really it was B. And you still have to deal with all the unstable half-baked libraries out there, which regularly lost stability every few months as the ecosystem switches to a new runtime or new build system. And so like now we're on Vite and before there was like, I don't know, Gulp and like all sorts of random stuff that, you know, at the time was like, this is the future. Um, but the future kind of changes every like year or so. Um, and I guess now we have like Turbo and then, you know, we were largely Node for a while and now there's like Bun and like all this other stuff. Um, and so, you know, there's like all these libraries out there, but then you basically need the combination of your use case and your libraries that you're using, the libraries that are out there, and then the compatibility with the libraries and runtime that they're using, um, which means that there's a lot of options out there, but the ones that will actually do what you need them to do are like feature complete and stable and will work with all of your choices um, actually becomes quite small and finding them can be hard. You often have to like try a bunch of them because there's no clear way from just like the dependency structure whether this will work for you or not, which you know, is, is a lot of lost time. And honestly, this is like the basis of why dynamic types and programming doesn't really work at scale because it feels fast um, to start with because it's easy to get started. Um, but then as soon as you try to use it for something real, it's like you don't know if it's going to break till you try it. And so you just waste so much time doing that. But I've got to say that TypeScript types are very good, actually, uh, especially when coming from OO land, these types feel very flexible and powerful. And so here's some, some highlights. So the first is that you can declare union. So you can do that thing that this is A or B, and you can do that directly in the type system. And it's very easy to do. You can declare static strings. So for instance, maybe I have a field on A and that's going to be A. And now I have a field on B and that's going to be B. And this basically supplants the need for any enums. There's an easy way for me to quickly check whether this is A or B based on my type, based on something it has. And so like I just said, you can easily differentiate, differentiate between these unions based on what it has. So if it's A, it must be A. If it's B, it must be B. And therefore you can discriminate which one you have at runtime in a type safe way. And because we're talking about type safety as it can be done at dev time, 
which is the single best way to improve your speed as a developer, we're now able to way more precisely model our domain and find incorrect, invalid states before it starts failing at runtime, the billion dollar problem. So all of this made modeling my domain with types feel much better. It gave me the power to model my domain at scale with the flexibility to do so with precision. So I wasn't bending over backwards, trying to reconstruct a union like you have to do in basically every other language. It just worked. Alas, while I enjoyed all of these benefits, while in TypeScript land, I did not enjoy it when I had to step out to integrate with the rest of the JS ecosystem. This was largely necessary at the time to get set up with a server to host your code, use NPM libraries, often with missing or out of date types, and deal with whatever other issues were caused by the newest build tool or runtime. This has gotten better over the years, but it's still there. And so it really is nice when you can stay in TypeScript land, which is typed, um, you got these good types and stuff, but because we're surrounded by untyped things. It's very easy for, you know, JavaScript to give me a B when I thought it was an A and it's supposed to be an A, but there's no, no enforcement at the edges. Um, and so that's where a lot of these problems are happening that you can try to prevent, but it's just the ecosystem. That's just the ecosystem and you're living in it. So you can't quite get rid of it all. F sharp and a happy medium. So I stuck with TypeScript and C sharp for years. I regularly experiment with different technologies like Python, Rust, Hacklang or PHP, um, static frameworks like Hugo and stuff like that but I just didn't find anything meaningfully better. So kind of stuck with these two. Now, as I got more experience with coding in my career, I found myself pushing more and more towards smaller, purer functions with immutable types and building architectures with a more functional core and imperative shell. To me, this meant functional, though I'd never really thought too hard about what that actually meant. It just seemed to lead to systems that were easier to understand and build and that had fewer problems long-term. At Instagram, we did a yearly advent of code group and one of our directors said he really enjoyed using F Sharp one year. He said it was fun to use and changed his way of thinking about programming, even if he didn't actually use F Sharp for anything else. I'd never really heard of it before, but was intrigued because it seemed to run on .NET and didn't seem too scary to try. It was functional-ish, you know, according to the description on the website, but the syntax seemed pretty familiar, kind of a mix of Python and C-sharp with some TypeScript looking types. So I started learning F-sharp because I was curious and it seemed like an easy way to learn more functional paradigms that I'd been dabbling with in my projects. And it was weird. It was different. I ran into a lot of issues trying to do simple things the way I used to. Things like async, early returns, and understanding standing currying were a few that, that took me a while. But over time, I started to see that there were other ways to accomplish the things I wanted to do. And perhaps those ways had some advantages. Slowly, I started to understand that these oddities weren't necessarily bad. Often guardrails pushing me away from pits of failure and towards pits of success. There were usually ways to still do it the way I was used to. F sharp is pretty flexible in that regard. But there was enough pushback to make me wonder if I should. Often, the answer was no. A few things I really liked about F sharp. One, it's got immutability by default, both at compile time and runtime, which means no lying. So TypeScript has its version of consts and I think actually does a pretty good job. There's always a way to get it mutable and in F sharp there's a way to get mutable as well. Um, but one I will really harp on is C sharp has this idea of, it doesn't really have consts yet, which is crazy to me. Um, and even if you do like read only versions to try to get constant non-changeable things in there, um, the compile time doesn't stop you. And there's often ways to get around the read only <laughs> immutability. And so it feels safe, but it's lying to you. A uh, Python does the same thing. You've got your frozen sets and stuff, which at runtime will fail. Um, but unless you've got like a, a good linter or something, it's not gonna be a dev time thing. So mutability by default is great, excellent, built into the type system, awesome. You know, destroys a whole area of, of pits of failure. Okay, the types are like just amazing, right? We got discriminated unions out of the box. We do functions. The functions have currying, um, which gives you so many options for dealing with types and composition, honestly. I didn't know how good a lot of these things were. I didn't know what they were uh, before I came to F Sharp. And now that I've been playing with it a while, I'm like, wow, other languages are like pretty uh, ancient. They like, they're kind of like stuffy. They don't like work well. Um, there's just better ways to do it. And and I always think of this like, if you like TypeScript and how it does types, F Sharp is the same types, but better. Uh, more things that, that are better. Next it's fast and general purpose. So it has like everything I liked from .NET, everything I liked 
for C Sharp, including the full access to the full ecosystem. I didn't know this coming in, but basically F Sharp can call C Sharp natively. Um, it has interop. So it's literally as simple as just pulling in the C Sharp function and calling it. It's like that simple. Um, so you don't lose out on anything of C Sharp, honestly. Um, and let's be real, .NET is very fast. Like, yeah, it's not as fast as Rust, but it's like a good 80% there. So you can use it for anything and it's a really good option for, for most things and even better because it actually has good types. Um, and the last thing is like, everything codes like link. And so I was telling you earlier how I really liked the idea of link because it's really easy to read the operations. And because we're doing these operations, uh, it's less code, it's more easy to understand like what we're doing. Um, there's less room for failure because you're not writing like for I and this loop and maybe you get the, you know, iterator wrong or maybe like set something wrong or whatever. It's literally just, we're gonna do this thing and then we're gonna do this thing and we're gonna do this thing. And so it works very well for link lists, but we also get pipes um, built in. And you'll see this in a lot of functional libraries for other languages is they, there's pipes that are, there's a library that does pipes and it allows you to basically just take the value, even if it's a single thing or a list thing, you can just pipe it into the next operation. And this is great because in most programming, this is what we're doing. Most business logic, like we're saying, hey, we got this thing and we got to transform it into this other thing. And there's like eight intermediate steps, right? In procedural, you've got those eight intermediate steps just there, which means that they're prone to side effects or you accidentally forget to do something with it. And now the whole thing's broken. With pipes, what you can basically do is like these eight operations are part of this one thing. And because they're piped into each other, there's no room for messing up. It's just a lot easier to write, much easier to read, and much more correct most of the time. I love pipes. Basically, any language without pipes, ridiculous. You need to use, you need pipes. That's that's the future of programming. Get with it. And so I continue to build with it, eventually building my own projects with it, moving into my core tech stack building a project boilerplate with it that I use for most of my projects nowadays, and more recently using F Sharp to build full stack server-side rendered apps. It's been a fun journey, and I really enjoy building with F Sharp. I've never built things easier with more correctness and with more satisfaction about how things fit together. They get out of the way and just work. And this is like my heuristic now. Like if I build something and it's not simple, it's not scalable, it's not systemic, it doesn't feel good, then it's probably a bad system. And I think it can be hard to get systems that feel good in other technologies because they're not, you know there's problems with it, um, but it's really hard to make it like not problematic. F Sharp flips it where it's like, most systems you build, if the types work and you're leaning into the immutability, it feels good. Of course, there's ways to make it better, but you're like, this is a system. This is a system that's not gonna break. It handles all of its cases. It's gonna be correct for what we expect it to do and it's gonna do it well. And that's kind of what we're looking for, being able to easily get to that point um, with your system. And that's what F Sharp does. And in that same vein, it's really helped me in other areas, like thinking about building safer, more scalable systems, especially at scale, you know? So not like my, my side projects, but within an organization, how a code base evolves over years and thousands of developers, millions of lines of code and stuff like that. And so when I step out of F Sharp back into other languages, like, um, you know, at Rippling, we're using Python, we're using JavaScript, TypeScript, now when I'm faced with those other languages and technologies, it's like much more clear to me where the problem areas are because most of the time they're gonna be modes of failure that F Sharp like doesn't allow. An example of this is Python is just mutable everywhere. Everything's mutable. Um, and we're passing all these records around and stuff. And like an easy one is like, how do we get immutable records in Python? How do we prevent this issue of we're setting the wrong string to the, the wrong thing? And by doing this, we've eliminated this whole class of issues. Um, but it's not quote unquote Pythonic. It's not what people were doing, even though they were running into this and shooting themselves in the foot like every week. But it's something that you, when you see the other side of things, you can more easily like objectively judge what you're doing currently in this other area. And so it's really helped me in that regard as well. Next. Now I'm still having fun with F Sharp and I'll likely continue to mainline it until I find a better language that comes out for, for writing simple scalable systems. And I think I'm, I'm similar to fast F Sharp here where it's like the reason I use F Sharp is not because I'm a F Sharp zealot is because like, I haven't found a technology or language that's better for these purposes. And if one comes out, I'd be happy to move, especially one that gets like mainline adoption. Like F Sharp is just not adopted by that many people, which is its main shortcoming. Um, so if there's a, a language that comes out like Zig that has like so much hype, you know, that's like a better fit for these kind of simple scalable systems um, and kind of gets rid of all of these pitfalls, then I'd be happy to move. 
but you know, I'm not holding my breath for this as I've seen this newest generation of languages come out, this newest hype, hype cycle. And honestly, I'm unimpressed. Um, tried Golang for a few months. I was like, this is not a good language. I can't believe we built this, uh, you know, after the nineties, like this is ridiculous. These newest generation of languages are just falling into the same pitfalls that we've seen and we've observed and we have talked about for like literally decades before I started coding. Like it's the same things that, that they were noticing in the nineties and the two thousands. Like these new languages are doing the same things. And like, yes, they're better than the previous generation, but like they're, they still have the same problems, but we know the solutions to those problems. And it's like, well, why didn't you do the solutions? You know? Um, so, you know, I hope, I hope a successor comes out. I hope a better language than F sharp comes out. Um, but you know, I'm not going to hold my breath for it because, uh, the track record doesn't look very good. Anyway, thanks for listening to my rants today. If you like this post, you might also like the best way to get started learning and building with F sharp, which is what I would recommend to anyone trying to get started. These are resources that I've used that were really helpful to me um, and that I think will get you started on the right track as, as fast as possible. You can also read why I'm moving from SvelteKit to F sharp, um, which is more about what I learned building full stack apps for several years um, and kind of my decision points for why SvelteKit, which you know is a leading, one of the most loved uh, full stack apps frameworks out there, just wasn't as good uh, for my workflows and my purposes as just moving to full stack F sharp. And finally, if you just want to get set up with a full stack F sharp in 10 minutes, kind of see what that looks like, you can check out Cloud Seed, uh, which is my F sharp project boilerplate. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.